we welcome you, our viewers throughout the whole world. Our topic today is one of the most crucial topic that we need to discuss. I have entitled our presentation, God's Plan for the Rich and Wealthy, Whether Unbelievers or Believers in God, in the Advancement of God's Kingdom. This is part one. And so, in a two series, we will understand what is God's plan for the rich and wealthy people, whether they are unbelievers or believers of God, because they have a very important role in the work of God. God's plan and will for the rich and the wealthy, whether believers or unbelievers in God. According to the scripture, the rich and the wealthy have important role to play in the advancement and significant role in finishing God's work on earth. Whether they believe in God or not, it is because God made them rich and wealthy. He directed and guided them. He arranged times and places circumstances and people to build their fortune so that it would bless not only themselves but also others and for his cause these are their holy service to God however many of the rich and wealthy did not know this truth and keep the longing for divine assurance and guide while others by God's grace know this truth discover God's plan for them. So we need to understand what is God's plan. Because there are so many rich people in the world out there, wealthy, yet not satisfied with worldly goods. Many of the rich and wealthy people like King Solomon had this conviction and in fact they confess, he who loves silver, will not be satisfied with silver. Nor he who loves abundance will increase. This is vanity. Ecclesiastes 5.10 So with the patriarch Job, if I have made my gold my hope, or said to find gold, you are my confidence, for I, I have would deny God who is above. Job 31, 24 and 28. Many of them do not go to church, for they see and think they receive little benefit. But these rich and wealthy in their own private lives need something that they don't have, a true eternal security of life. And so, we will unravel what the Bible says of the rule of the rich and the wealthy in the advancement of God's kingdom. But we will ask some serious question. Do you know that God has given you a very significant, noble role in his great work? Rich and wealthy men, do you know that it is God's blessings that makes you rich and wealthy? Did you discover God's plan for your temporary riches that the Lord lent to you? Or do you know how to turn your passing riches into eternal blessings? Don't you know that the Bible has a number of models of rich and wealthy who fulfill God's plan and purpose, believers or not? You must know this truth. So please come listen to this message and know what God has for you in his heart. Many rich and wealthy are greatly misunderstood and misjudged. But on the other side, as we understand, the rich and wealthy have a general black stigmas that people place upon them. In turn, 
they have also put the same stigma to the disadvantage. This is a chaotic problem of human nature. You know that there is a deeper longing in your hearts for something better. Something that your riches cannot answer or provide, neither satisfy. Something worth living beyond and after this life. But first let us know some of the important truth. The truth about the rich and the poor. The Bible says, Proverbs 22, verse 2, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Job 34, 19 says, yet he, God, is not partial to the princess, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor. For they are all the works of his hand. First Samuel 2 verse 6. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. The rich man is wise in his own eyes. But the poor has understanding searching him out. Proverbs 28 11. Here we can see to be a poor is a blessing. To be rich and wealthy is a blessing as well, but with a greater responsibility. With this biblical revelation, we understand it is God who makes us rich or poor. There are some reasons with that, but I'm not going to discuss that today because that is not the intention of this message. God has a huge heart for the poor. How about the rich and the wealthy? So, as we learn, we look at first the poor. The favorite texts of the poor Christians are here. For example, in the inaugural address of his mission, Jesus said that the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Luke 4, 18. In the Beatitudes or the Sermon of Jesus in the Mount, the disadvantaged people, listeners, the readers console themselves with the assurance, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Here we see that Jesus really his heart has huge space for the poor. The disadvantage. When John the Baptist was in prison, he sent a message to Jesus. Are you the Messiah or should we be expecting someone else? The Lord replies, go back and report to Jan what you hear and see. That the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy cleanse, the deep hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Matthew 11 verses 2 to 5. So here we see Jesus really loves the poor. But it is, that is not the whole picture. We need to look at also the shocking and the unbelievable truth. The Bible, especially the New Testament, deal much more in the gospel, okay, that Jesus talked more about money, wealth, riches, than prayer, faith, second coming topics. Meaning to say, it is shocking to many. It is unbelievable truth that in the gospel, Jesus talked much about money, wealth, riches, rather than compared to prayer, faith, second coming, or any other topic. In the research of Howard Dayton in 1973, he found out that the Bible talks 2,350 references about money and its use, while faith and prayer has only 500 verses. Why is it? Because God knows that our attitude towards money is an indication of where our heart is. 
We either follow the goal or God. We will either turn our wallet on worship when into the source of our security. Money is the source. Resource, I mean, but not the source. So this is shocking. Why Jesus talk really 200, 2,000 plus verses about money, wealth, riches, rather than prayer, the kingdom of God, second coming, and those topics. Because it is one of the most crucial points in the end of history of our world. Either we follow the gold or God. And so, the question is, how difficult really for the rich and wealthy to enter eternal life? Let's look at the general portrayals of the rich people in the New Testament. Okay? There seems no be ending on the issue of difference between rich and the wealthy. In some aspects, rich and wealthy are synonymous. But there are significant differences between the two. However, I'm not going to discuss that matter, although we may consult Genesis 26, verses 12 and 13. In the surface reading of the New Testament, the destiny of the rich and wealthy people are, seems to be bleak and dark. Very little hope to have eternal life. This is the general perception of many readers. Besides, misinformed readers of the Bible also jump into the conclusion. But let us unravel the negative perspective and dig deeper whether this assessment is valid or otherwise. We start with the common text. No theological analysis, just read. God has a big heart for the rich and wealthy, but the rich have small hearts for God. Is that correct? Let's see. Let's look at first Mark 10, verses 23 to 26. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to, the, to enter the kingdom of God. That is shocking. Because it is the Lord himself, the creator of the universe, the creator of humanity, and the one who produced all the substance of this world, coming from his mouth, telling how hard it is for those who have riches to enter in the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his word. They were so surprised. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Follow up. When it is repeated second times, meaning there is an emphasis. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle rather than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly surprised Saying among themselves, holding can be saved. In a few verses, close sequence, Jesus repeated three times. It is hard for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is hard for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. And it is easier for a camel to pass through a needle eye rather than a rich man. And if we read Luke 6.24, What to you who are rich for your Savior consolation? There is a curse. Because the word woe is not a blessing. It's a curse. But let's continue. Look at the picture. Jesus said that. Let's look at this narrative. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in a purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, 
who laid at his gate desiring to be fed by the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his whore. So it was the bigger, then the bigger died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and buried. And being in the torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and call my tongue. For I am tormented in the flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive good things. And like Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comported and you are tormented. Luke 16, 1925. Did you see the picture? It added more difficulty that those who are rich, comfortable, but in the end they are tormented and those who are having hard time to maintain life, life is a struggle, they are comforted. Not only that, Let's read another episode in Luke 12, 14 to 21. But he said to him, man who made him a judge, an arbitrator over you. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke in a parable saying to them, the ground, the ground of the rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, say, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So much harvest. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But while he was speaking, God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things which you have provided? So he is who lay up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The picture really is bleak. So dense, so dark. For a, for a rich and wealthy man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at it again. In the last judgment where Jesus sits on this white throne, recorded in Matthew 25, verses 41 to 46. And then he will say, in the day of judgment, the poor has God's blessing over the rich. We see then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Oh! Those who are not concerned where the riches, they go to everlasting fire, suppose that is prepared for the devil and his angels. For Jesus says, I was hungry, and you give me no food. And I was thirsty, and you give me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not make me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Likely, these are the poor. They were neglected by the rich and the wealthy. Then the Lord, then they also answered to the Lord, this is the rich. The wealthy, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, as surely I say to you in as much as you did not done it to one of the least of these, you did not do it. And this will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So the rich committed the greatest sin, the sin of omission and negligence to the disadvantage.
In my analysis, the problem is not riches and wealth. It is the heart. That's direct according to the Bible. But let's go to the question. Who makes man rich and wealthy? The Bible has answered. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Who gives us power to get wealth? You did not become rich because of your ingenuity. Though those have parts. Because you have studied. You have strategy. You have planning. You have capital. Yes. But unless the Lord guided you, you cannot reach such heights in your life of receiving such blessing. Both riches and honor come from you, O Lord. You roll over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. Second Chronicles 29, 12. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10, 22. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Proverbs 22, 24. Now acquaint yourself with him, be at peace, thereby God will come to you. Here we see that it is God who really make a person rich. It is God. That's why our topic is what is God's rule, God's plan and rule for the rich and wealthy, whether you believe in God or not, in the advancement for his kingdom. It is so interesting that in the Bible, says, Gabe, this is the condition of riches. Because it is God who bless you, who bless us. Even our life, that has come from you. It is a gift from God. Our strength comes from God. So everything comes from God, but he does something because he knew that you have the capacity and the ability to share later on. If you will. So Luke 6.38 says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure. Praise down, shaking together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. It's very interesting. So how do you treat the poor? How do you treat the disadvantaged? What measure you give? There is one who scatters and yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Proverbs 24, 25. Well, gain by this honesty will be diminished. But he who gather by his labor will increase. Here are the conditions. Proverbs 13, 11. So, do not be wise in your eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. And it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. And honor the Lord with your position. With the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your baths will overflow the new wine. Proverbs 3 verses 7 to 10. Here we have a condition. Since God who blesses you, it's time to recognize him even you don't believe on him. That's a paradox. And so, we need to be careful for riches because sometimes riches, our wealth, most people trust in them and they become greed. Who is faithful in what is less is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust what is less is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, money, 
treasure, gold, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Jesus is asking them. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness because one's life does not consist in abundance of things. No one can serve to master. Either he will hate one and love the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. But rich and wealthy can serve God with their money. But let's go to a deeper meaning. What is God's purpose for creating man? The book of Isaiah says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I form him. Isaiah 43, 7. The people I have formed for myself, they are declare my praise. What's the purpose why God created us? The rich and the wealthy, the poor. We are created for his glory. Created for his praise. This is what he said. That's why it says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do you all to the glory of God. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's the purpose why we are created. What's the purpose? Why God created you to be rich and wealthy? The same. For God's glory and for God's praise. You cannot praise and glorify God unless you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, Mark 11, verses 30 and 31. All these are used in making riches and wealth on earth. We use our heart, we use our soul, our mind, our strength in finding, getting, accumulating the riches and wealth of the world. So, I'm going to discuss now God's model. First, let's look at those believers. We'll look at Job and Abraham. These two are really wealthy people. So, God's rich and wealthy models, Abraham and Job. There are so many rich and wealthy people of God mentioned in the Old and New Testament. We select two as God's model, Abraham and Job. Abraham was not a believer of God. His family, Terah, has been worshiper of other gods in Mesopotamia. But when God called him, he responded. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go out from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who will bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessing. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. Did you understand that? He was already wealthy, 75 years old. And yet, when God called him, he was a pagan, worship other gods. But I like the attitude of Abraham. Just leaving your family, your father, everything, and go to the thing. There's something inside. In his being that he responded to God. So, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. When he was called. Genesis 13, 2. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, and most high possessor of heaven and earth. I will take nothing from a trade to a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should see I have made Abraham rich. So, when these five kings were overtaken, and then they were so grateful to Abraham because they were rescued, and Abraham said, I will not take anything. 
Because you might say it added to my riches. Because Abraham, according to the Bible, Abraham obeyed my voice, keep my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. Genesis 26 5. Although he has some setbacks, but rich and wealthy person can follow Abraham's faith and God. And so, let's look at Isaiah. According to Isaiah 51, look at Abraham. So we look at him as Father Abraham. Luke 16.30 The father of many nations or multitudes. Genesis 17.5 He is called the friend of God. James 2.23 So rich, so unselfish. His faith and obedience tested to the utmost. He brought blessing to those who follow his life of faith and obedience to God. But above all, this he looked to the city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. He was not destroyed by wealth and riches. Rather, it blessed him and it blessed others as he served the God of heaven. We can follow. You can follow. Rich and wealthy people, you can follow Abraham. And so, God has a model for rich and wealthy who believe and serve him. Another man, let's go. Abraham, now let's go to Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, who feared God, turned away from evil. Did you understand this man? Blameless, upright, who feared God, turned from Abel. He does not entertain Abel. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and female donkeys, and very many servants. So this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. He was rich. So rich and wealthy, but so righteous, who feared God, upright, blameless. And that's why God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth. Blameless, upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He repeated that twice. Job Chapter 1, verse 2, and Job chapter 2, verse 3. But let's look at who was Job before the calamity hit him. Because you understand only all of that. But if you, if you study thoroughly the book of Job, he is really God's model of being rich and wealthy. Let's see. When I went into the gate of the city, I took my seat in the open square. A young man saw me hid, and the ages arose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of the noble was hushed, and their tongue was sucked to the rope of their mouth. Job 29, verses 7 and 8, meaning to say, a rich man commands respect. He respected the man because he was treated with dignity, honor, and respect by all kinds of people because his lifestyle was due to his fear of the Lord. Listen. When the ear heard, it blessed me. When people heard, oh, Job is coming. The ear, the ear blessed him. When the eyes saw, it approved me. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless, he who has no helper, the blessing of the perishing man come upon me. Who you can just imagine such wealthy person, righteous, so concerned with the disadvantage. The blessing of a perishing man come upon me. The person is already dying, but he blessed Abraham, he blessed you. I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. 
Job's presence was a blessing. His active social concern and responsibility and action. That is God's model. He was self selfless, concerned to the lowest class of society. He said, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the limb. I was the father to the poor. I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the pangs of the wicked and plucked the victim of his teeth. What an incredible man. So rich and yet has a lot, plenty of time in doing social work that he needs to do because God has blessed him so much. Men, listen to me. Waited. Keep in silence for my counsel. After my words, they did not speak again. My speech settled them as a dew and waited for me as a rain and opened their mouth wide as a spring rain. His strength, he was the strength to the weak, to the helpless, to the victim. And he was the counselor and refresher. What a kind of person, what a personality and character, this God's model who was rich. He said, I chose a way for them. I sat as a chief, so I dwelt as a king in my army, one who comports the mourner. Wow. And he said, he was a model leader. I have made covenant with my eyes. Why should I look to a young woman? For what, what is an allotment from God above? The inheritance of the Almighty from on high is not destruction of the wicked, disaster of the workers of iniquity. Thus he does not see my ways and count all my steps. Wow. He remained faithful to his wife. But look at the rich and the wealthy today. He said, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, if I lurk into the neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. For that would be wickedness, yes, and iniquity, deserving judgment. For that would be a fire that consumed to destruction and wrought out all my increase. Incredible personality. That's a rich man, righteous man. And so, he had a very unquestionable honesty and integrity. He said, if I have walked with falsehood or if I hasten, hasten to deceit, let me be way in the just balance and God know my integrity. If I step and return the way of my heart, walk after my eyes, if any spot adheres to my hand, let me sow and another it. Yes, the harvest is rotted out. How about main servant? He has many servants. He says, I have not despised the cause of my man servant nor my maid servant, nor they have complained against me. What shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes me, how shall I answer? Fair justice and treatment to everybody, rich or poor, all people. And so, Ready to provide those in need in life, even the enemy. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or a poor man without covering, if my heart has not blessed me, and if he was not warm with the flesh of my sheep, if I raise my hands against the fatherless, he feed the sojourner, the traveler, the stranger, should not lodge on the street. I open my doors for traveler. I did not rejoice the destruction of him who hated me. This is a spectacular character of a very rich, wealthy person, righteous, and all of that. He is running away from sin, and sin has no power over this man. He said, I have not made gold my hope. It's not my confidence. I have not rejoiced because of my wealth was great, that my hand gained much. 
In fact, I have not worshipped others. When the sun shines, nor the moon moving its brightness, it did not entice me because I would deny God who is above. Where was the Job's joy? In the blessing of others. He was not great, selfish, obsession of riches. He had no other gods except the God of heaven who made him rich and wealthy. Try to read Job chapter 29 and 31. You will see the whole picture of who was Job before the calamity came. He did not also cover his sin. He said, I have not covered my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. So we have touched to Abraham and Job. They were believers. Now let's go to the unbelievers. Because all the past and present kingdoms of this world with their kings and queens and princes in ancient worlds or leaders in the modern world had been ordained by God whether they knew it or not. The rise and fall of this kingdom before and nations now could be traced to eternal counsel of God whether they fulfill the purposes for their existence. So let us review the most powerful, rich and wealthy nation in the ancient world, Egypt. God declares to Pharaoh, Indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I miss you, that I miss you my power in you, that my name be declared to all the earth. Just imagine that. All those kingdoms outlined in Daniel, it is God who raises all those kings to test the purpose whether they believe or God or not in the God of heaven, because God has a purpose that his power, his name may be declared. And that is true today. And so, the God is the owner of this world, is in control. In human eyes, the flow and name of history of the world and today, as if controlled by human ingenuity and powers, but no. Listen to Proverbs. Many are plans in man's heart, but the Lord counsel will stand. God's plan and counsel is the bliss and stand forever. He removes kings and raises up kings. That is later, Daniel 2.21. So, meaning to say, the flow and the aim, the changes of time and seasons of leadership throughout the whole world is that mandated by the God's counsel. The same principle of God's modus operandi in treating with unbelievers and believers who are rich and wealthy. They rise and fall depending whether they follow God's plan and will or purpose for raising them, using their means for self-gratification or to bless others as God's plan. And so, did you get the point that God's people, Israel, maintain their faithfulness? Only in a short time, during the leadership of Moses and Joshua, thereafter is a history of unbelief and rebellion. The ten tribes ended in Assyrian captivity. The two tribes ended in Babylon. It ended in Babylon. And so, we need to understand that because of the rebellion, there was a bleak, ugly, darkness situation. And this particular time, God called the Gentiles to help and bless Zion, the city of the Lord. Look, rich and wealthy people, read Isaiah 60. This is the message of God to you. Those who do not believe. The Bible says, the Gentiles come with them. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. And they shall bring gold, incense. They shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. They shall ascend with access, acceptance on my altar and will glorify the house of my glory. Isaiah 60, verses 3, 6, and 7. Because God's people was taken to Babylon, taken to Assyria, and they were scattered all throughout. They don't have capital to rebuild Jerusalem. And God called the Gentiles, the unbelievers of God, 
They will bring the wealth of the Gentiles. They will come to you, bring gold incense, and they praise the Lord. I like that. So it means to say that there is a significant role of the rich and wealthy. They enrich God's people and they themselves bless and enriched by them. The Gentile mission to Zion, the city of God and people. What the? They brought riches and wealth, but also doing missionary works. These Gentiles that God called them was to bring the sons of Israel from afar. Their silver, their gold with them. To the name of the Lord your God, to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. So, the sons of the foreigner shall build up your walls, and their king shall minister to you. Therefore, the gate shall be opened continually, that they shall not be shut day and night. Men may bring you the wealth of the Gentiles and kings in their position. Wow. At the beginning, we see an ugly picture. But here now, when we see the revelation, God has a big heart because he knows the rich and the wealthy could do greater work in the advancement of his kingdom and he did that in history. And they are going also to do that today although we do not know who are these rich and wealthy who supported God's cause in the advancement of his kingdom. But let me cite only one. The ancient Persian. They had a prophet, Zoroaster, established a monotheistic religion in Persia. This ancient religion holds only one supreme deity, Ahura Mazda, the creator, sustainer of all things. So, Zoroastrianism expresses and adheres to faith based principle of good thoughts, good works, and good words. God, the invisible owner and ruler of the world, orchestrated the events as well. He used pagan kings for his praise and glory. The students of the Bible have known King Cyrus, King Darius, King Artaxerxes, who recognize and obey the God of the Jews. God had a great work for them to do. First, saving God's people in Babylon and provided manpower, financial support, security in rebuilding of God's temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. Here are some ancient uh, figures. King Cyrus, King Darius, King Artaxerxes. They are all pagan. But God called them to bless Israel who were in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. King Cyrus and King Darius, the conqueror of Babylon, the media Persian king Cyrus recognized and accepted the God, the sovereign God of Israel. In his decree, he said, thus King Cyrus of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord of God of heaven has given me. He was pagan. And only he commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Israel 1 verse 2. The full decree of King Cyrus is in Israel chapter 6 verses 3 to 12. The decree was affirmed and reaffirmed also as a decree of King Darius. Chapter 6 verse 12. So King Cyrus, Darius, and Tassarsis were so rostrenists in their religion, but they practiced hit, hit, hino, hinotism. What is hinotism? Hinotism is a practice and belief of worshiping only one God without denying the others. They recognize other gods. So the decree was implemented with no alteration. The decree stipulates According to Israel 6 4, let the expenses paid for the king's treasury. Wow, they have their own God, Ahura Master. But the God of heaven is it? Okay, let the expenses in rebuilding the God of Israel in Jerusalem 
will be supported by the king's treasury. And let, it is repeated, let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men. And this should not be hindered. Also, I, dec I decree, whoever alter this edict, his house will be destroyed and they will be destroyed. Why? Because I'm on the work of God in rebuilding his house in Jerusalem. King Artaxerxes. This king was the finisher of God's work in Jerusalem. He was known as the kings of kings, according to Israel 7.13. He wrote and gave royal decree to Israel the priest and described in the scripture and the decree, the whole decree is written in Israel chapter 7 verses 12 to 26. According to Israel, the king granted him all his requests and instructed in a decree to carry the silver and the gold which the king and the counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling place in Jerusalem. What a magnificent God who was moving the rich and the wealthy pagan because they have a significant role in finishing in the sanctuary in the Old Testament and in finishing the spiritual sanctuary that is the people of God in the end time. And so they have a role. Did you remember the wise men? They called the magi. The wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is the born of king, the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship. When they saw the star, they were rejoicing exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw a young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped. And when they opened their treasure, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and meat. Divinely guided. Just imagine, they are walking Thousands of miles in the desert. Guided just to visit Jesus because God already blessed those who has the intention to understand that it is God who blessed them. Because frankincense, mirror, and gold is really the stuff of the rich and the wealthy. So, the rich and the wealthy, God has a great plan for them in supporting God's work. Only if they watch carefully the leadings of God in their lives. They can do great things in the cause of God here on earth. If with love and commitment they place their lives, their riches and wealth in the hands of God who is the ultimate owner of everything on earth. It is Martin Luther who said, I have held many things in my hand. I lost them all. But whatever I place in God's hand, still that I possess. It is painful when God break our hands for the things we held so tight that's supposed to bring blessing to God's cause. And if we open our hands and those who know your name will put their trust on you. For you, o Lord, have not forsaken those who have seek you. What a blessing. To be a rich, to be wealthy, when we recognize that it's God's hands who make them rich. So it's time to return to the investment of the Lord. Our Father trusted in you. They trusted, and you did deliver them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and we're not ashamed. The truth of the matter is that God has first served people. Who become rich and wealthy in all the world from their borrowed lives and times and bless them abundantly. God claims, God owns the silver and the gold, Haggai 2 6. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Now that you become rich and wealthy, it's a high time to acknowledge. And return all the investment of what the Lord God has placed in your hand. So you may fulfill the purpose of creating you and making you rich and wealthy. The greatest problem of the rich is not their wealth. Just like you. 
You know, Satan was in utter failure in destroying or shaking Job's faith, trust, and confidence in his God. Job's security and certainty is upon God. The devil was the author of all misery of all rich and wealthy. With a man joke. The same also those rich and wealthy today. Satan deceived the whole world. Satan filled their hearts. Blinded them. Finally destroying health together with them. Job's loss was temporary. It was restored by God double. The Lord restores losses which he prayed to his friend indeed. The Lord gave twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed him more than the beginning. God made him rich and his riches and wealth did not destroy him, rather bless him and others. Let's face the reality. Choose in the sight of God. You may lose temporal but not eternal. Money, riches, and wealth are actually is not the core problem of the rich and the wealthy. The help economy of the nation, they help people through employment, they give money for a noble cause, for a common good. But the greatest problem is so difficult for them is to give themselves and their heart to God. Why not try God this time? Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is not satisfied with their income. This is too meaningless. As good increase, so consume them. What benefit they to do to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Obsession of richness is like drinking salt water. Thirst and hunger for end has no end but secure and fulfillment. Rich and wealthy. Start to put your temporary richness and wealth in the bank of heaven. The painful truth is that nothing we have brought to this earth and certainly nothing we can carry when we die. We have to choose either to invest the bank of heaven, that is in Matthew 6.20, 25 and 27, or the bank of the world. Paul speaking beginning and the main of human existence. Now godliness with contentment is gain. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing. 1 Timothy 6.4 and those who are banking, Jesus questioned, why you did not put my money in the bank? It's the bank of heaven. Luke 19, 22, 23. The Lord is expecting of a sure return of investment when he comes. Investment in heaven or hell investment. Investing in heaven while on earth is always in the narrow way. Investing on earth is always a wide way and want to know the result of the unsaved? Jen has the answer. When a thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to the deceive of the main nation to the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. To gather them into the battle. In the number are like the sons of the seashore. How many of them will be in the lake of fire together with Satan and his angels because he deceived them through his, their rich, riches and wealth. This is the final description of those who never invested their riches and wealth in heaven, lost forever. I want to appeal to you. Now you have sent our mother that even you are believer, in God, you have a role, significant role for the cause and the advancement of God's kingdom. If you are unbeliever and yet you are rich and wealthy, you have also a role in finishing God's work in this earth. So rich and wealthy people, believers or not, in the stream of time, where do you invest your temporal riches and wealth? Determine your final destiny. May the message that we have shared together open our eyes. Those of you who are rich and wealthy, you have a role. The poor has a role, but you have more of significance because in you there is power. It is God who gives you power to get wealth and become rich because he knows 
that you can contribute something that is important in finishing God's work, whether you believe in God or not. It is my prayer that in the first part series, we will put, you will put, is my prayer, your riches, your wealth in the bank of heaven. And when everything said and done, when this earth is no more, you still possess them because you invested them to the owner of all the universe, which is God. This is my prayer.